I think we're good to go. All right, great, thanks. All right, folks, uh, good morning to everyone and welcome to the Bigelow Lecture. It's a real pleasure for me to be on this panelist side as Chair of Department of Surgery with all my cardiac colleagues. And we are welcoming Dr. David Taggart today uh, to give the Bigelow Lecture. He'll be introduced formally to all of you in just a moment. Insofar as Dr. Bigelow was concerned, I always like to begin with a bit of history in introducing these lectures. And uh, Dr. Bigelow uh, was born in Brandon, Manitoba. He received his medical degree at the University of Toronto in 1938. His residency was also at the University of Toronto. And he was overseas uh, during World War II, and that began his interest in hypothermia. In 1951, um, legend has it that he was the discoverer of the pacemaker. 1952, he performed the first open heart uh, procedure under hypothermia. 1953, the first open heart uh, lung machine, heart on lung machine. 1953, he started the first cardiovascular surgery division in Canada. And over the course of his lifetime, he trained well over uh, 40 cardiac surgeons. I mean, it should be remembered that back in the 1950s, this was a burgeoning and evolving field, cardiac surgery. Uh, mortality and morbidity rates were quite high. So this whole... Um, Division has come a long, long way since the early days of uh, Dr. Bigelow. Dr. Bigelow is uh, still remembered and he's still active um, in current times uh, on social media, as you can see here on a number of his uh, photographs. And uh, we were speaking this morning and typically members of the Bigelow family will join us for these lectures. And we're delighted and hope that they are here today to listen in on uh, the Bigelow lecture. Uh, I'll just uh, draw to your attention this book by Dr. Bigelow. Uh, it's entitled Cold Hearts. It's a great read. Um, it's a story of hypothermia and the pacemaker and surgery. And uh, I'll just finish my intro with this quote, which is from Dr. Bigelow and this book. Uh, Humility is an open-mindedness which is acquired by an understanding of the meager state of our knowledge in relation to the vastness and elusiveness of the ultimate truth. This this quotation is similar to the history of uh, cardiac surgery in a way, but also to all of science. I think it applies uh, certainly to all that we do in the field of science. So with that, I'll uh, stop sharing the screen. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Taggart, who will now be introduced by Dr. Terry Yao. Morning to everybody. And as you know, the Big O Lecture is the annual highlight of the uh, academic calendar for the Division of Cardiovascular Surgery at the University of Toronto. And this year, we're very pleased to again have the support and the presence, I believe, of Pixie Bigelow Curry, uh, Dr. Bigelow's daughter and members of her family. I'm very pleased to introduce our 2021 Big O Lecturer, Professor David Taggart. And David has been for many years the Professor of Cardiovascular Surgery at the University of Oxford, and he is best known as a clinical trialist. He has conducted in his lifetime over 20 randomized clinical trials of various interventions that we use in cardiac surgery. And for those of us who understand trials, we recognize, given the complexity of the interventions that we seek to evaluate, what a lifetime of work that has been. And David's particular subject interests relate to multiple arterial grafting, off-pump coronary bypass surgery, and the rigorous evaluation of what is still the most commonly performed operation across the field of cardiac surgery, namely coronary bypass surgery, to percutaneous coronary interventions. He also has interest in uh, the quality assessment of grafts and novel interventions to enhance graft patency. And these interests have led over the years to about 350 peer-reviewed publications, two textbooks, the founding of the International Coronary Congress and the co-founding of the International Society for Coronary Artery Surgery. And so I've asked David, and he has very kindly agreed to give a lecture on a very particular topic today. And that is basically the use and perhaps the misuse of randomized clinical trials to distort clinical practice. Now, most of us would regard with very good cause randomized trials as really the gold standard by which we seek to evaluate the interventions that we use every day on our patients. Um, and uh, you know, for no, for, uh, for sure, this is uh, well regarded as perhaps you know, the best way that we can approach the truth in seeking uh, the uh, outcomes and, and concepts of what we use to uh, our patients every day. Now, that concept of truth seems at times to be a quaint, uh, quaint idea these days. And so perhaps it is not 
by accident that in 2016, the uh, word of the year for the Oxford Dictionary was post-truth. And certainly it seems that there is an, uh, a growing part of the population a disconnect between the concept of an objective reality and their own biases constantly reinforced. And it is perhaps in the human nature to believe that which we hear most loudly, most frequently, or which reinforces our own personal biases. We can see the consequences of that kind of thinking sometimes close to home and sometimes even on our own doorsteps. But those things are obviously very different. You know, the search for bias in randomized clinical trials is as far from those other failures of critical thinking as this is to this. And yet in a sense, it's all a question of the number of breaks. And so as surgeons, as scientists, it is in our nature to examine the bricks, even those with which we have built our own houses. And so with that, I'm looking forward to a very provocative and, and uh, talk from Dr. Taggart today. David, thank you again for coming to join us virtually this time. Hopefully we will get you in person the next time. And we're very much looking forward to your 2021 Big O Lecture. I will now share my screen if I can. Can you see my screen, hopefully? Yes, yes, we can. That's great, thanks. So let me start by first thanking the panel for a very generous introduction to me. And I would also like to start and emphasize my thanks to Dr. Yao, the Department of Surgery and the University of Toronto for bestowing this truly great honor on me. My main regret is that, that I cannot be with you in person today. So the title of my talk, Distortion of Clinical Practice by Randomized Trials, Inadvertent or Intentional, is, is designed to be a little bit provocative, but hopefully you'll see some truth in what I say today, either in relationship to your own clinical practice or your own areas of research. I do have some conflicts of interest, but I don't think any of them are particularly relevant to this presentation today. Now, we've already heard, let me, we've already heard from Dr. Rutka about the great Dr. Alfred Gordon and Bigelow, both a surgeon and a scientist. And it, interestingly, he made enormous contributions in two areas. That was, as Dr. Rutka mentioned, the story of hypothermia and the introduction of the pacemaker in heart surgery. And he's been described by another great and giant of cardiovascular surgery, Dr. Tyrone David, in JTCVS in 2005, that Dr. Bigelow was the father of cardiovascular surgery in Canada, although his achievements now go far beyond that border. I think I'm going to start by prefacing my lecture with two very important cautionary warnings about what we all should be aware of as doctors. And particularly with relevance to trials and clinical, routine clinical practice. And the first is by Richard Smith. He was the former editor of the British Medical Journal for 13 years. And in 2005, he described medical journals and an extension of the marketing arm of pharmaceutical companies. And he later made it clear that he regretted he had not published this while he was the editor of the British Medical Journal. And then I'm going to read another cautionary warning from Marcia Angle, a former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009. Conflicts of interest and biases exist in virtually every field of medicine, particularly those that rely heavily on drugs or devices. It is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. So if you look briefly at what randomized clinical trials are, Randomized is defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as unpredictable, unsystematic in order or arrangement. So randomized trials therefore produce groups that are not systematically different with regards to known factors, but arguably even more importantly to unknown factors. 
Allocation of patients is not determined by investigators, clinicians, or participants. This therefore reduces unknown or known confounding factors which can influence outcome, and no other study design can achieve this. Randomized trials are a vital component of evidence-based medicine hierarchy, both in terms of class of recommendation, where one means do, two means consider, and three means don't do, and also in determination of the level of evidence, whether from meta-analysis, single randomized trials, or simply clinical opinion. RCTs are the major evidence basis for clinical guidelines, and they are now the accepted gold standard assessment of new therapies and required for approval of new drugs by regulatory bodies. Now, if you look at the history of RCTs, the first recorded was 600 BC, when Daniel of Judah compared the health effects of the vegetarian diet versus the royal Babylonian diet over 10 days. But in terms of modern science, randomized trials were first used in agricultural trials in the UK in 1923 by Fisher. And then the father of the modern randomized trial is Sir Austin Bradford Hill. And he was credited for this with his iconic MRC, Medical Research Council trials of streptomycin in tuberculosis in the 1940s. The Cochrane database currently holds over 150,000 randomized trials, which form the basis of evidence-based medicine. In our own area of cardiovascular disease, RCTs have set the standards for almost everything we do, and that's because of the common prevalence of cardiovascular disease, the frequent occurrence of events, especially combined major adverse cardiac and or cerebrovascular events, the fact that you can reach achievable sizes to minimize type two errors, and these trials have completely changed almost every aspect of cardiovascular therapy. Now, before I become iconoclastic and appear to attack randomized trials, I want to emphasize, and Dr. Yao mentioned some of these facts very kindly in his introduction. I'm a great believer in randomized trials. I've personally either conducted or participated in over 20 of them in nearly 30 years. I have two higher degrees, both based on randomized trials and cabbage surgery, and have published over 300 scientific manuscripts, a large proportion of them dealing with randomized trials. I'm particularly proud I was a principal investigator of the ARC trial, published the 10-year outcomes being published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019, and that involved 28 centres in seven countries. So again, I would like to emphasise in this lecture, I'm not trying to be boastful or exaggerate, and I am a great believer in the principles and practice of randomised trials. And I attribute this slide to a good friend and colleague, Mario Gaudino, a professor of surgery in Cornell, who pointed out that the ART trial, if you compare it to every other interventional trial of coronary artery disease, is the largest when you combine the number of patients, 3,100, times 10 years of follow-up, as I've said, performed in seven countries in 28 centres, but giving 30,000 patient years of follow-up. And we have just recently been awarded funding now to follow these patients from 10 to beyond 15 years. So if we look at the evidence base for any intervention, we can compare two strategies. The randomized trial, unquestionably the gold standard because it eliminates bias for both known and possibly more importantly, unknown factors. But randomized trials are also susceptible to a number of very important weaknesses. They often only include small number of patients. They often only include a small percentage of the total potentially eligible population, and therefore they may be actually populated by an atypical pop patient population. And this is then compounded by short-term follow-up, large numbers of crossovers, and they're very expensive to run. If we look at the other form of evidence, which is clinical registries, and especially propensity match registries, the strengths of these are that they may contain tens of thousands of patients, reflect real clinical practice, and are relatively cheap to run. But of course, their major weakness is, I'm sorry, their major weakness is the potential for confounding by biases, either that we actually may know about, but more importantly, that we may not know about. 
So if you look at randomized trials that end up having distorted best clinical practice and ask ourselves, was this accident or was it by design? Was it cock up or conspiracy? So here are the important questions for us to consider when we look at any randomized trial we read. And we need to always think first, is it actually easy to have manipulated the trial to give a desired outcome? Secondly, in terms of statistics, beware. And do not be misled by very sophisticated statistical arguments. If when you ask yourself and look at the data and simply realize the basic numbers do not add up. What about the source of funding of the trial and could that have affected the outcome? What about the conflicts of interest of the principal investigators, the most obvious being potential financial conflicts of others, but others that may be less obvious? Then ask yourself, are these trial patients really typical of my routine clinical practice? And how easy would it be to make one in intervention appear inferior to another? And then ask yourself, do these distorted randomized trials then adversely influence guidelines? And do distorted randomized trials still adversely affect routine clinical practice? So if we deal with the first question, how easy is it to manipulate a randomized trial? And I go back to this article written by Richard Smith, the former editor of the British Medical Journal and published in 2005. And he asks the question, how does industry get the right answer? And his answer is, you design trials that ask the right question. And he emphasizes, there is no need to fiddle results or suppress negative results. So what do you do? You can conduct trials of your drug, if it's a drug trial against a treatment known to be inferior. If you're comparing a competitor drug, you can use a dose that is too low, so your drug will seem more effective, or for your competitor drug, use a dose that is too high, so your drug will seem less toxic. Then, in terms of the trials you conduct, use non-inferiority trials. These use arbitrary wide confidence intervals, which can hide real clinical differences. Publish subgroup analysis that favor your results. Publish multiple endpoints, especially those again that are favorable to your results and publish results from the centers with the best results. And publish the results that are most likely to impress. One of the most common mistakes you see even in the most prestigious medical journals today is that they pub publish relative risks rather than the actual data. So if you're told the hazard ratio for a new intervention is 0 0.5 compared to the standard intervention, this of course sounds very effective. But if it's a change from 1% to 0.5%, is that truly clinically relevant? The other crucial warning we've been given since 2007 is the danger of non-inferiority trials, as published in this paper in The Lancet in 2007. The authors emphasized that these trials designs use arbitrary wide confidence intervals that allow you to perform smaller, cheaper studies, but it comes at a cost. And they argue non-inferiority trials expose patients to clinical experiments without any assurance that the experimental arm is not worse than the standard treatment and without really exploring whether it is better. They conclude, we believe that non-inferiority trials fail to meet the commitments of good clinical research. Ask an important question and answer it reliably. Although a non-inferiority study reduces research and developmental costs and commercial risks thereafter, it asks no relevant clinical questions. Randomization should not even be allowed in such trials since it is unethical to leave to chance whether patients receive a treatment that is anticipated to provide no extra benefit, but could be less safe and less effective than existing treatment options. And another important comment on statistics is from the former and late Emeritus Professor of Cardiology in Oxford, Professor Peter Slight, when he wrote about the danger of subgroup analysis. And he wrote, in regards to the international study of infarct survival trials, in retrospect, perhaps one of the most important results in the ISIS trials was the 
analysis of the results by astrological star sign. All of the patients had their date of birth entered as an important identifier. We were therefore able to divide our population into 12 subgroups by astrological star sign. Even in a highly positive trial such as ISIS-2, in which the overall statistical benefit for aspirin over placebo was extreme, division into only 12 subgroups threw up two for which aspirin had a non-significantly adverse effect. And remember again that a p-value of less than 0.05 still means there's a 1 in 20 chance that the result is wrong. So what about the source of funding of randomized trials? This was addressed in possibly one of the best papers ever published in medicine in JAMA in 2006, where the authors looked at 303 consecutive superiority trials according to the source of funding, and then published in the three most prestigious medical journals, JAMA, Lancet, and the New England Journal. And they looked at the distribution of trials according to not-for-profit, mixed funding, or for-profit. They then looked at the percentage of trials where the new treatment was significantly better than standard. And they showed that for the trials overall, and whether you move from a clinical endpoint to a drug trial, to a device trial, as you change the source of funding for the trial, you were far more likely to get a positive result if the trial had been funded by a for-profit organization. And the authors concluded, recent cardiovascular trials funded by for-profit organizations are more likely to report positive findings than trials funded by not-for-profit organization, as are trials using surrogate rather than clinical endpoints. And this topic was explored again by John Ioannidis' group at Stanford when they published this paper in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology about a decade later. They looked at 319 trials of which almost 60% had been funded commercially. This included over a quarter of a million patients, of whom 82% were in commercial trials. They showed that the commercial trials were more likely to be larger, to use non-inferiority design, to have a favorable result, and to have a higher citation impact. For favorable results, the odd ratio for commercially funded trials was almost three to one, and a favorable result when the odds ratio looked at non-inferiority design trials was still over three to one. And they pointed out that almost 97% of commercial trials had chosen a non-inferiority design, which led to a favorable outcome. And the authors concluded, the literature for head-to-head -head randomized trials is dominated by the industry. Industry-sponsored comparative assessments systematically yield favorable results for the sponsors, even more so when non-inferiority designs are involved. And I would caution you and ask you all to reflect on those conclusions and how that may impact on your own areas of clinical medicine. What about the financial conflicts of principal investigators? This was reported in the BMJ in 2017, but they showed very clearly financial ties of principal investigators were independently associated with positive clinical results. These findings may be suggestive of bias in the evidence base. So the next question we come to, are trial patients actually typical of routine practice? And to answer this, I'm going to talk about coronary vascularization, my own area of expertise. Because here we've had randomized trials now for all over half a century. The first cabbage was performed in 1964 and then stents not that long afterward in 1977. And cabbage remains one of the most commonly performed major operations. Over half a million cabbage operations still perform worldwide each year. And I would emphasize no other surgical operation has ever been subjected to the same scientific scrutiny as coronary artery bypass grafting. And we know a lot about it, and we've known for over a quarter of a century, based on this seminal paper by Salim Yusuf and colleagues, looking at 10-year outcomes of cabbage, and then published in 1994, 
Now, they made a very important observation. They reported cabbage was better for patients with two or three vessel coronary artery disease if that disease involved the proximal left anterior descending coronary artery. And they also reported for cabbage, there was no benefit in patients with one or two vessel disease if it did not involve the proximal LED. Now I'm going to emphasize those two points again because they are crucial to what happened next. Yusuf and colleagues showed that cabbage did have a survival advantage if you had two or three vessel involved coronary disease involving the proximal left anterior descending, but not otherwise. So if you're aware of those facts, could you actually use that to design randomized trials to show that stents are as effective as cabbage? So can you design a randomized trial to prove a stent has the same benefit as cabbage? And hypothetically, the answer would be yes. And here's how you do it. You take a, an original population, 100% of your patients, with angiographically proven multi-vessel coronary artery disease. And what you would then do is exclude 76% where the outcome, as I've told you, is already proven to be better with bypass grafts. So you're now down to 24% of the original population on angiographic criteria. But now you will exclude a further 18% because whereas cabbage can treat all lesions in the coronary arteries, by stents cannot. So you're now down to 6% of the original population for the cardiologist and surgeon agree patients can be ra randomized. But from the very original population, you will have already lost 2% for patients don't want to be randomized. So you're now down to 4% of the original population. And now if you look at these patients, you realize you've got a population with one or two vessel disease and good left ventricular function. So before the first, so before the first patient is randomized, you can be absolutely certain that you're going to demonstrate no difference in survival between cabbage and stents. The next thing you have to do is then to say, how can we generalize these results from this very highly selected population to the whole population with coronary artery disease? Another thing you may try to do is to have journals that publish these results, have people write sympathetic editorials that completely ignore the major flaws and limitations of the trial that you're describing. And your final effort would be to use these randomized trials to underpin guidelines. Now, of course, this is only a hypothetical exercise, so it could obviously not actually happen in real clinical practice. And especially not in a prestigious field of cardiovascular medicine, dominated by randomized trials and where the evidence basis is held very highly and often led and conducted by distinguished investigators. So, as a theory, it could happen, but you think surely it could not in practice. I'm sorry, there's something wrong with the controls that are not quite um, right in this bit. But anyway, it's, it's come up. But the point I want to make now, this is what precisely happened in cardiovascular medicine. And I explored this subject when I was privileged to give the Ferguson lecture to the Society of Thoracic Surgery in 2006. And I pointed out that although there were 15 randomized control trials of PCI versus cabbage, if you look at the actual number of patients involved, although it was around 9,000, it was only 5% of the original population. And if you compare those trial patients to those actually undergoing cabbage in the United Kingdom, they were completely different. The majority had one or two vessel disease with normal ventricular function where we already knew there would be no benefit of cabbage over stents. And I addressed this formally in The Lancet in 2009, where I said, most significantly, the randomized trials only enrolled around 5 to 10% of the eligible population, the majority of whom had single or double vessel disease in normal left ventricular function, a group in whom it was already well established that there was no prognostic benefit of cabbage. <laughs> 
by largely excluding patients with a known survival benefit from cabbage, including left main and triple vessel coronary artery disease, and especially impaired ventricular function, the trials ignored the prognostic benefit of surgery in more complex coronary artery disease. Nevertheless, the inappropriate generalization of the trial results from the highly select populations to most patients with multivessel disease has been ubiquitous in the literature and has, at least in part, justified the explosive growth in PCI in developed countries. And in the same lecture, I looked at, well, so what were the guidelines saying at that time? And I quoted the ACC AHA guidelines, European Society of Cardiology, and the British Cardiac Society. And they all said almost all patients can be treated by PCI and none recommended a surgical opinion. But when you say, well, who wrote the guidelines? The Americans used 23 cardiologists and a single surgeon. The Europeans doubled the number of cardiologists and got rid of the surgeon. And the Brits used eight cardiologists and one surgeon. But if you add up these numbers, these guidelines were written by 77 cardiologists and two surgeons. And I argued at that time, surgical societies should no longer provide a token surgeon on cardiology guidelines as they are hopelessly outgunned and ineffectual against what are, in effect, exclusive cardiology dictates. If surgical opinion is genuinely to be heard, there must be comparable numbers of surgeons and writing committees. And I have to say, things improve very substantially. And one example of the improvement where in 2010, where the European Society of Cardiology and combined European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery guidelines. So these were unique because now there were 25 members from 13 European countries. It involved a fair distribution of experts nine non-interventional cardiologists, eight interventional cardiologists, and eight cardiac surgeons. And this was the basis of what we now all consider to reflect the modern heart team. And the guidelines were extensively reviewed by external referees before publication. And if we look at the, those guidelines updated twice in 2014 and then 2018, we can see if we look at where is the evidence basis today? Well, for left main coronary artery disease, almost two thirds of patients are in a category where they have a 1A classification for cabbage and either a class 2A or class 3 for PCI. For patients with three vessel disease without diabetes, almost 80% of patients in routine clinical practice have a marked survival benefit from bypass grafts. And those benefits, we don't have time to go through all today, but they're exaggerated in patients with diabetes. And what I would say is, even although cabbage is substantially superior to the use of PCI for most patients, if surgeons used more arterial grafts and better guideline-directed medical therapy, they could be even better. And how else can trials affect outcomes, even if unintentional? Well, we explored the use of guideline-directed medical therapy in all the contemporary trials of PCI and cabbage, and we showed that cabbage patients substantially received inferior medical therapy throughout the period of follow-up, not intentionally, but because they didn't get the same care of follow-up as patients undergoing stents. And the argument here is very clear. If these cabbage patients who did better than patients receiving stents had also received better medical therapy, then the differences between cabbage and PCI would have been even greater. But is it also possible to try and stack your trial where you can make one outcome appear inferior to another? If you look at the trials of PCI versus cabbage in the syntax trial, the protocol specifically stated that for cabbage, arterial revascularization is strongly recommended. So in other words, use the best surgery versus the best stent. But in one of the syntax centers, that the, the actual surgeon who was recruited to do the cabbage surgery was predominantly a valve surgeon who did not use multiple arterial grafts. And that same center excluded one surgeon who is very highly experienced in cabbage and predominantly did arterial revascularization. And why is it important? If you look at that center, and it was the third largest performing center in the syntax trial, you can see that the MACE rate in the cabbage group in that trial was very high in the cabbage group, 
but very low in the PCI group. So how does this all affect what we do today in practice? Here's a slide from the OECD looking at, it's not a decade old, but looking at the ratio of the elective PCI to cabbage per 100,000 in 24 OECD countries. And you can see the first blue arrow at the top is Canada and the United Kingdom, both pretty similar. PCI to cabbage ratio then about two to one, would now be around six to one today. But if you look even back then, there was a fourfold difference in Europe in those countries performing PCI, simply dependent on the practice of the interventional cardiologist in the hospitals where the patients went. However, if you look at these figures today, compared to what's happening in Japan and Korea, it's still pretty easy in North America and Europe because the ratio of PCI to cabbage in Japan and Korea is 20 to one. And at that same time, we showed in the, U, in the United Kingdom, surprisingly, despite the fact that we had a national health service, even within the United Kingdom, there was a 13 fold difference in the ratio of PCI to cabbage between the lowest and highest performing centers, although geographically, they were only 40 miles apart. And we concluded this variation is unexplained by procedure volume or deprivation, suggesting the contribution of unwarranted influence, which may include practitioner preference. And again, we saw the same thing happening in Ontario. This is an important study by the Canadian Medical Association, which looked at the 17 cardiac centres in Ontario providing both PCI and cabbage. And what they documented a five-fold difference in the influence, I'm sorry, in the ratio of PCI to cabbage, simply dependent on which hospital the patient was treated on. It varied from 1.2 to 1 to over 6 to 1. And the authors pointed out that 96% of the patients had not been discussed by a heart team, but that the physician performing the diagnostic catheter and the treatment hospital were strongly independent, independent predictors of the mode of revascularization. And what does this also mean in terms of the risk of performing the wrong intervention? Well, this was again discussed and reported by Hannan and colleagues in circulation in 2010, looking at 16,000 cath lab patients in New York between 2005 and 2007, where the treatment decision may, was made for intervention by the cath lab cardiologist alone in 64% of patients. And what they showed was that if you even had an ACC AHA recommendation for cabbage, only 50% of patients got cabbage, but one third had PCI. On the other hand, if you had an ACC recommendation for PCI, 94% of patients had PCI. And if you had equipoise between cabbage or PCI, according to the ACC, 93% of patients still received PCI. The authors also pointed out that up to 92% of PCI procedures were ad hoc, so there had been no real time to discuss genuinely real patient choice, and therefore the implications for that for genuine informed consent, and that the chance of PCI had increased in hospitals with PCI facilities. And Ray Gimmins, a former president of the AHA, wrote, addressing that paper, a final potential explanation and in my view, the most concerning is that these recommendations for PCI in patients indicated for cabbage reflect a grow the business and make it up in volume mentality in response to declining reimbursement rates. There are compelling financial incentives for cardiology performing intervention to do more procedures, even when the patient might be better treated with cabbage. And remember, this is published in circulation. He then went on to say, however, should surgical consultation be encouraged, as suggested by the authors? And he argued surgical consultation should be considered, but not mandated. But that seems quite contradictory and counterintuitive when you read what he had written earlier. And another important consideration is how does all this impact on patients and their understanding for consent and the information they're given? This is a paper from the BMJ. 2014, looking at almost a thousand patients undergoing elective PCI in 10 of the most prestigious academic US hospitals. And somewhere between 70 to 90% of these patients believed 
that the reason they had undergone PCI was to save their life, prevent myocardial infarction, and extend life expectancy. Three things that elective PCI we know absolutely does not do. And interestingly, only 1% of patients correctly identified that the only reason they were going to have elective PCI was to reduce symptoms. So if you look at randomized trials today and look at those that either distorted clinical practice, whether by accident or design, I think we can say the following. Is it easy to manipulate trials to give a desired outcome? And the answer is yes. What about the statistics? I've said you need to be aware of them. Don't be fooled by the fact you're not an expert statistician. We can all look at the manuscripts and ask ourselves, do the basic numbers add up and make sense? And be very wary of non-inferiority trials. Does the source of funding affect the trial outcome? Yes. Do principal investigators have conflicts of interest? Yes. Are trial patients typical of routine clinical practice? The answer is very frequently no. Is it easy to make one intervention appear inferior? Yes. Do distorted trials influence guidelines? Absolutely yes. And do distorted trials still adversely affect clinical practice? And the answer is yes. Now, so the clinical conundrum, how do we protect patients when we have concerns about randomized trials? So how do we prevent patients from receiving a wrong intervention and doctors from administering a wrong intervention? And I think the answer is both guidelines and multidisciplinary heart teams. My own view is very much that professional societies should persuade the payers, whether public or private, that they should only reimburse interventions agreed by heart teams based on recommended guidelines or where there is clear documentation as to why the guidelines were legitimately not followed. And I think if this is what we did widely in medicine, we would stop inappropriate practice almost overnight. Now, I know that a lot of the audience today are cardiologists, so I'm going to finish with one of my favorite slides, which is the great father of interventional cardiologist, Andres Grunzig. He did, died tragically young at 46 in an aeroplane accident over Arizona. But he wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1979, we estimate that only about 10 to 15% of candidates for bypass surgery have lesions suitable for this procedure, PCI. And we fast forward a little bit to 2016 to this editorial in The Lancet by three great cardiologists, Lionel Lope, Patrick Comerford, and Bernard Gesch. They wrote, in view of the survival benefits shown for coronary artery bypass mapping, the real controversy is why patients with symptoms and anatomy known to benefit from the procedure are still submitted to percutaneous coronary intervention. So on that point, I'm going to conclude my talk. I hope today I've tried to illustrate that randomized trials are not just an academic debate or something we don't have to be concerned with, but how very much they do influence routine clinical practice, but how we must always be wary of those trials and ask ourselves, do they really reflect real clinical practice? My final comment again is to thank Dr. Yao, the Department of Surgery and the University of Toronto for the enormous privilege of making this presentation today. You, the audience, for your attention. And again, my sincere apologies, I'm not with you in person. Thank you very much for your attention. David, thank you so very much for an excellent and exactly as uh, thought-provoking talk as we were hoping for. Uh, thank you. So, so that was a fantastic uh, 2021 Big O lecture. Now, um, I'm just for the general audience, uh, you know, for anybody who has questions, um, you know, please uh, either raise your hand, which will allow us to uh, get your name to the top and unmute you so you can ask questions. Or if my Zoom skills fail me, then please uh, uh, type them into the Q&A of the chat and then we can pass these on. Um, while we were setting that up, uh, uh, David, a, a quick observation, a quick question. I've often noticed that as you said, the non-inferior non are the margins that have been set in some of these trials, you know, ex, uh, basically would suggest that a difference in outcomes that, uh, that they may see would be judged as, you know, insignificant. And yet in a conventional superiority trial that was favoring perhaps, 
some uh, drug therapy that was uh, being sponsored, these would be those same magnitude of differences would be hailed as a major advance. And so, so it's it's a very good example of how um, the trials are skewed to to what uh, a sponsor may want to find. Um, the question is like you know the the industry of running randomized clinical trials these days is so gigantic with CROs, sponsors, and the regulatory agencies like FDA Health Canada and even our own institutional regulatory processes, you know, that it seems almost impossible these days for an independent mm -hmm. init uh, investigator initiated trial to have the uh, wherewithal, including the financial resources to run a, a trial. And so sometimes it seems like, you know, to that uh, magnitude of resource requirement is only the province of large sponsors. Do you think it's possible for us to reverse this trend and actually make it simpler and cheaper to, to run clinical trials? So great points and great questions. And I, and I think you've very much summed up the difficulty we have today. We have moved so far down the line of using non-inferiority trials sponsored by industry. It's now over 95% of trials. And of course that's because they want to use wide arbitrary confidence intervals that allow them to say the, the new intervention is not inferior. But as I pointed out in the Lancet paper, this, you could argue, technically, is quite unethical because it's not answering the real clinical question. How do you turn it back when public bodies don't have the fundings of the major device or pharmaceutical industry? I think it's going to be extremely difficult to do that. And it can only happen if the leaders of the professional societies make a statement to that effect. An individual clinician trying to do it would be completely unsuccessful. But if major bodies like AATS, STS, EAX, or the cardiology equivalents came out and said, we feel it's very important we go back to superiority trials and we at least have at least part of the funding from a public body. Unless that comes from our leadership, it, is, it, it simply cannot happen. An individual physician arguing this will not get anywhere at all, but a professional society might at least make people think. Thank you very much. That's our own here. There's some very good uh, questions and answers that I would like uh, Dave to address them. If you click it, all, all four are excellent. To take a look at question answers from the audience. Yeah, we can set that up. And in the meantime, actually, we have hands up from Viv and Steve. Like so, Viv and Steve, if you can unmute yeah. yourselves. David, and wonderful lecture. Great to see you again. Thank um, you. Great. Thank you. Uh, one, <clears throat> one issue that you alluded to, but I'd like you to expand on, is indication creep that's supported by these trials. So as you very nicely showed, the, the industry showed that you know, two vessel corners, he's treated by PCI is no different from cabbage. Our local cardiologists would then convert that into multivessel disease treated Correct. by PCI is no different than cabbage. And now you're having the indication creep into triple vessel, proximal LED and left main disease. And that's common with microclip and tabby yes. devices now as well. So do you want to comment on the, the indication creep that we see? Yeah, so I, I think it's a great, great to see you first, and great question as always. So, and that is what happened. And, you know, what I tried to, I think, show was how you can set up a trial, you know, as Richard Smith, the editor of the BMJ had said, you set up your trial to give the answer you want by asking the right question. But the real danger of what we saw, and I don't know how to stop it, is, how, is what you have called indication creep. We went from knowing something we already knew, which was that for one in two vessel coronary disease, there would be no difference between PCI and cabbage. But those results were then widely used to extend it into the whole multi-vessel disease population. And if you read the editor, I'm sorry, if you read the articles or, or, and or the editorials that accompany them, to most readers, they wouldn't have a clue what these trials were about. You know, I was privileged to give the Ferguson lecture, so I spent literally months digging through the 15 trials that existed at that time, when it, before it became very aware that these patients were very high, highly selected and atypical. But if, you know, I can't, so what I would say is if a journal is publishing 
any article now, it should have a mandatory guideline in the conclusion of the abstracts. How relevant are these patients in this trial to routine clinical practice? You never see it and it's always disguised. Steve, and then we can go to the Q&A. Uh, Steve, you're muted. Thanks, David. Uh, great talk as usual. And I'm Thank very you. appreciative of everything you've done uh, for cardiovascular surgery. Um, so you mentioned heart team, strongly recommended by societies now, and variable uptake in different hospitals. Yeah. Um, so uh, heart teams are supposed to make uh, decisions based on practice guidelines, which are largely enforced by RCTs with all their limitations. But the, uh, the alternative approach is personalized medicine. And uh, there's a big push towards personalized medicine, which I think will probably get stronger over the next decade or so. Yeah. And, and how, do you, um, how do you marry the two? Well, great to see you, Steve, and, and an absolutely great question. There is no, no doubt whatsoever that we will move to personalized medicine. But largely what we're doing that just now is more on looking at the innate patient risk factors according to their biology or DNA. How, you, how that would translate into making sure the guidelines are applied properly. I mean, what I can say, and I hope I was fair, was to say that the guidelines that we practice by today are far better than they were a decade ago because they're written by both surgeons and cardiologists. There is a better awareness of the limitations of randomized trials and the evidence. But equally, you said it, and you're completely correct. You know, if you go to Germany today, speak to any German cardiac surgeon, there's almost no implementation of heart teams whatsoever. It's still the sole dictate of the interventional cardiologist. In the UK, generally, and in Oxford, we have very robust heart teams. So I, I absolutely know that in our centre in Oxford, the working together of cardiologists and surgeons means that we genuinely try to recommend, make the best recommendations to individual patients based on the totality of evidence. But, you're, but, but the fundamental problem is that there's a great part, a great areas of the world where that still doesn't happen. It's simply based on what the cardiologist has decided they're going to do. Thanks very much. That's great. Thank you. David, we actually have a number of uh, excellent questions in the Q&A nice. session. Like you may be able to see that as well. But um, the first one is from Seema Mittal. With regards to the consensus guidelines, it's important to appreciate that the recommendation can get included in the guidelines as long as it gets a majority vote from the expert panel. And she's asking whether or not guidelines should publish the distribution of the vote for each recommendation to indicate the diversity of opinion within an expert panel? I think it's a great suggestion. I absolutely agree. And I would like to recommend Samantha to be part of the guidelines in future. <laughs> a question from Karen Devon. Should we focus on effectiveness rather than efficacy trials? Do you think that most of these problems are implicit or explicit biases? Is it actually possible to, to eliminate bias in the research, even if not financial, aren't other biases, i.e. notoriety, going to emerge? Well, again, a great question. And um, it would take quite a while to answer all of that scientifically. But what, what I would say is that the general things that we now know about the trials are who, the two, two absolutely critical questions for the trials is, who are these patients? And secondly, what is the duration of follow-up? Because in every single trial of PCI versus cabbage, as you follow the patients for longer, you see this divergence in benefit of cabbage. So there should be some minimum standards or guidelines where there is an agreement in advance, who are the patients in the trial, how representative are they of routine clinical practice, and how long will we follow them up for? And then, of course, make sure that both arms of the trial get the same guideline-directed medical therapy. Thank you. David LaBelle asks, so why take part in these bias trials? Why do you think that prestigious uh, physicians are taking part in misleading the patients? A provocative I mean, question to, to match a provocative lecture. <laughs> yeah, well, well I, I think whether consciously or subconsciously, there are enormous potential conflicts of industry. 
I, I mean, sorry, conflicts of interest. Um, you know, so for instance, do I blame stent companies for wanting to sell stents? No, that would be like blaming a car company for wanting to sell a car. You know, that's what their job is. That's what they do. But but where I think things have not been done well is for the medical profession to have been more critical of what's happening and to demand more rigorous interpretation of what really happened in these trials. And that that has absolutely not happened in the medical press. And I go back to read, if you read Marcia Angle from the, the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, she said you cannot, she is the former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine saying you cannot believe what is written in this journal. That's, that's extremely worrying. And Richard Smith of the BMJ saying the same. So when you've got people of this prestige telling you that even in the very major medical journals, you cannot read what you believe. And you, the, the most recent example of this, which I was involved in, and I haven't discussed today, was the Excel trial, where I genuinely believe the way it was reported in the journal didn't reflect the data in the paper. And that's why I withdrew. Fantastic. David, Doug, we are, we, I'm actually very pleased that we had a, a good uh, chance for, for questions and answers. Um, thank so, you. So thank you again for a scintillating and, uh, and very provocative uh, talk that really has uh, outlined some concepts that are uh, fundamental to all of us as surgeons from various specialties and physicians uh, and scientists as well. So, so thank you for a wonderful 2021 Big O Lecture. Okay, well, you and I will be catching up shortly in a, in a different session, but uh, thank you on behalf of the university uh, for, for uh, delivering a fantastic lecture this year. Thank you. Can I just, before I sign off, can I thank you personally again for your wonderful approach to me. Thank the Faculty of Surgery for this enormous privilege and thank the University of Toronto. I'm enormously honoured to have been given the opportunity to do the to do this. And as I say, my only regret is I wasn't with you in person today. But thank you very much to everyone for this opportunity. Dave. Thank, thank you, David. Bye-bye.